If you have your Bibles with you this morning and you wouldn't mind, can you go to the book of 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, just a single verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, verse 7. And so there was this lady, and she had joined a Weight Watchers club. And uh, she was, you know, going, and she was pretty faithful and everything, but she went to her latest meeting, and she was very, very upset because she was still uh, gaining weight, and she couldn't understand what was going on, and she was very upset. And so, you know, in their, their club, they get together, and they, they encourage one another, and they talk to one another and stuff. And so they begin to ask her uh, about her previous week and everything. And, and so, well, she admitted that it was her husband's birthday, and so she had baked him his favorite cake. And so they had dinner, and then they all had a piece of cake, and there was half a cake left sitting on the counter. And she said every time she looked at that cake, it was just driving her crazy with temptation. She wanted to eat some of that cake so bad, and she just kept telling herself, no, I'm not going to eat it, no, I'm not going to eat it. And then finally she gave in to just a little bit of temptation and she went over and she just cut off just the tiniest little sliver of that cake and she had it. And then a little bit later she went back and she cut off just another little sliver of that cake and, and she said, and that just kept going and going throughout the day and then before you know it, I had eaten the whole half of that cake. So she felt really bad. She's like, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't control myself, but she said the biggest thing is that I didn't want to disappoint my husband because he had been encouraging me and telling me how good I was doing, and I didn't want to disappoint my husband. So they said, what would you do? So she said, well, I baked a whole nother cake. And they said, well, what about the half? She said, well, I ate that half to make it look the same. <laughs> How many know that willpower and self-control and discipline and moderation and all of those things, how many know that's a biblical concept? The Bible talks about self-control and it talks about discipline a lot. And all of these things are a biblical concept. And so this morning as we continue talking about the seven godly virtues, this morning we are going to talk about temperance out of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 7, Paul is writing to Timothy here, and he says to Timothy, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So let's look first of all at what is temperance. Temperance is a very common theme all throughout the Word of God. We see it a lot in the book of Proverbs. We see it a lot in the New Testament. It is defined as moderation in action, thought, and feeling. It is moderation in the indulgence of appetites or passion. So when we say temperance, what we're talking about is self-control. We're talking about you and I having control over our flesh. We're talking about having control over our spirit. We're talking about discipline. We are talking about restraint. We're talking about having control over our flesh, over our actions, over our emotions, over our words, over our behavior. So in Galatians chapter 5, Paul lists out and gives us the fruits of the Spirit. And he says in 522, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And he says in verse 23, gentleness and yes, self-control. And he says against these uh, such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So Paul says that we are to have self-control, that we are to crucify our sinful passions and our desires. See, self-control is paramount to living a righteous lifestyle. It is impossible to please God without it. Many times we walk around in our Christian faith and we say, well, I just don't understand why God is not taking the temptation away. 
If God wanted me to stop doing this, he would stop putting this temptation in front of my life. See, our sinful nature does not magically disappear when we become a Christian. We are going to battle with sin. We are going to battle with temptation until Jesus returns. One day when we are given new bodies, the Bible tells us that the corruptible will put on the uncorruptible. There will come a point, there will come a time when we go to heaven, when we are with Christ, when we will no longer struggle with these things. As Nicole was saying this morning, that he will wipe away every tear. There will be no sickness, there will be no disease, that sin will no longer be a part of our lives. But until that point, we are going to struggle with sin. We're going to struggle with temptation. Temperance is about mastering our desires and passions. It is about you and I ruling over our sin. God says to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, he says to him, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, he warns him here. He says, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. And he makes a very clear and pointed statement to him. He says, you must master it. In other words, he says to Cain, you must rule over sin, not the other way around. You cannot allow sin to rule over you. Paul says in Romans 6, 12, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present them to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. In other words, Paul is saying that when you give your life to Christ, there is a shift in our attitudes, behaviors, words, actions. There is a shift in our spirit, in who we are. And no longer does sin rule over us, but God's spirit. When the Bible talks about being born again, right? It's what, what, what Nicodemus says to him, that doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about? How am I supposed to go back into the womb and be born again? And Jesus explains this to him that yes, that is a physical birth, but what we are talking about is a spiritual birth. That spiritually we are renewed and born again and new and we are no longer a slave to sin. But this new spiritual person now comes out from the bondage of sin and we come under Christ. That we are set free from sin. People say, well, I can't stop sinning. Yes, you can. Does that mean that you're not going to have failures? Absolutely not. But yes, we can stop sinning. Jesus Christ died and shed his blood so that you and I can come out from under that bondage and have a new life and be set free from sin. Paul, in that scripture that we just read, Paul understood the power of our sinful nature. Paul understood the power of the sinful nature that lived inside of him. That these two natures are struggling against each other. Paul understood that there is a spiritual battle going on inside of him and inside of each and every one of us. He understood that even though Christ reigned in him, his sinful nature still existed. Paul makes some very interesting statements in Romans uh, chapter 7. And in verse 15, he says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. Verse 18, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, within my flesh. Right? He's talking about the sinful nature. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. 
In other words, Paul says, I want to do what is right and good, but there is this battle and struggle in me, and my flesh really wants to do the things that I don't want to do. He says in verse 19, for the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now that scripture can be misinterpreted in the sense, and people have, and they say, well, it's not my responsibility when I sin. It's that sin nature that's in me, and that's not me because I'm a child of God. That's that sin nature, so I'm not responsible for it. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that there dwells within him a sinful nature. These two natures, one that wants to please God and one that wants to please the enemy and sin and reject God. And he said of these two spirits, he said that is the spirit that is doing these things that I don't want to do. We all have a sin nature that dwells inside of us. Its desire is to separate us from the love of God. If we are going to live a right and righteous and good lifestyle, it requires sacrifice. It requires discipline. It requires bringing our flesh into subjection, denying our flesh. It requires temperance. Jesus says to, uh, in Luke 9.23, he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, you and I have a part to play in this. We cannot just simply walk around and say, okay, Jesus, take it all away. I got a bottle of Jack in my hand, but Jesus isn't taking it away, so it must be okay. When Jesus says, I have died on the cross to give, it, to give you the power to deny your flesh and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Let's look secondly at, are you and I temperate? The opposite of temperance is self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is defined as the habit of undue gratification of one's own passions, desires, or taste with little or no regard to the cost of others. That's very interesting. I mean, obviously we could see and define what self-indulgence means, but, but it's interesting that the, the secular definition of that includes that phrase with little or no regard to the consequences or who we may affect or hurt in the process of desiring and getting what we want. How many of you have ever heard of the church of Satan? Okay, that's a real thing. Obviously, it's been around for a long time. Uh, um, excuse me. Um, they've done, you know, they go out and they protest and they do all sorts of things. They've been around for a long time. And um, one of the, they have nine fundamental beliefs in the church of Satan. Right? Like, you know, the assemblies of God, we have 16 fundamental truths. You know, these are, are the things that, that we uh, are the very fundamental beliefs that we believe. You know, that Jesus died and rose from the dead, etc., etc. They have nine fundamental beliefs in the church of Satan. But the one that is the most common, the one that you hear the most, it is the number one in the list, is self-indulgence. It says... Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Nothing is to be gained by denying oneself pleasure. Religious calls for abstinence most often come from faiths that view the physical world and its pleasures as spiritually dangerous. That's because they are. It goes on to say, Satanism is a world-affirming not world-denying religion. In other words, what they believe is that our sin, they don't deny that there is a sin nature in us. What they believe is that that sin nature is a good thing. We've been created with a sinful nature and that denying that sinful nature is going against the way that we were created. 
And that you and I, coming from a religious belief, denying all those things are just wrong. We are denying who we are as a person. That we should indulge that sinful nature. It's good. It's who we are. It's right. And it should be embraced. It's kind of like Marxism and communism. When you think about, we look at the world and we see all of these people in the streets trying to push and promote socialism and Marxism and communism as a good thing. But when we look back at every single society that has ever tried it, it has been an abysmal failure. It puts people in bondage and slavery and poverty and starvation and all of these things, yet they're still promoting it as good. It's the same thing. We know what the end game of self-indulgence is. It leads to broken homes, broken marriages, alcoholism, drug use, and everything else that you could possibly imagine. There is nothing good that comes out of it, yet we are so blind to it. They believe that self-indulgence is a strength, that it is empowering, but the reality is it is the exact opposite. It is the weak man who cannot say no to his flesh. It is the weak man that cannot deny his every instinct and impulse. We see men going around and touting how many uh, girls they've been with as if they have done some great and wonderful thing. My dog can do that. It does not take strength to go out and do anything that you feel like doing. It takes strength to deny yourself those things and say no. It is the weak man that cannot control his behavior. It is the weak man that cannot control his emotions. It is the weak man that cannot control the words that come out of their mouth. Self-indulgence promotes the worst and most wicked parts of humanity. Aristotle said the self-indulgent man craves for all pleasant things and is led by his appetite to choose these at the cost of everything else. I know that we do not have to live in self-indulgence. I know that Jesus Christ, through his blood on the cross, has given me the power to say no to my flesh. That does not mean that we are not tempted. That does not mean that we do not fail from time to time. Absolutely, we do. But I know that I do not have to live in sin. I know that he has set me free from those things. One commentary said that God has given Christians his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has also given Christians self-control. And self-control is the ability to control one's emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations or during temptation. Paul says to Timothy in our text, he says, God has given us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and yes, self-control. So the question is, are you and I temperate? Are you and I controlled by the Spirit of God that lives within us? Or are we controlled by the Spirit of our flesh? Are we able to deny ourselves, to live sacrificially, to put the needs of others above our own needs? Are we able to control our behavior Are we able to control our emotions? Are we able to control the words that we speak? Some people, you got to love these people when they say, well, I just tell it like it is, right? I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to say it like it is. It's the truth. I'm just going to speak it. And they tout that 
as if that is some sort of virtue of bravery. And, you know, I'm such a brave person and I'm good and virtuous because I don't hide the truth. The reality is you lack self-control over your flesh. You lack self-control and discipline and maturity and temperance over your mouth. Do you know that every thought that pops into your mind does not have to be said? The reality is probably 90% of the stuff that pops in our mind doesn't need to come out of our mouth. Even if we're right. But see, when we lack temperance and we lack discipline and we lack maturity, we, it all just comes out. We just say it, we just say it like it is. And we don't care what the consequences are. We don't care who, what we've done or who we've hurt or, or what all of the ramifications may be because, you know what, I'm a good, virtuous, and brave person. I just say it like it is. James says in James 1.26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet do, does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. New American Commentary said an unrestrained tongue is a highly destructive force and an instrument of deception. It goes on to say control of the tongue stands for control of the whole self against temptation to indulge evil desires to become deceptive about one's own double-mindedness. Let's look lastly at embracing temperance. How many know that our sinful nature that is battling inside of us has one objective and one goal? What is it? To separate us from the love of Christ. To pull us out of God's will. To get us to indulge and embrace in sinful behavior and get us as far away from Christ as possible and ultimately take us to hell. That is the goal and objective. And there are two spirits battling inside of us every single day. The word of God does not deny this. The word of God does not paint some glorious picture of once you give your life to Jesus, everything's just going to be perfect and rosy. You're never going to have any struggles or any problems. You're never going to sin or lie and everything. You're just going to skip daisies and down the, the, uh, 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 the yellow brick road and everything's going to be wonderful. Whoever preaches that to you, whoever tells that to you, is a liar, and they do not know the word of God. The reality is, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, the struggle is going to increase. The enemy is not going to like it. It is going to come against you hard, constantly, and do anything that he can to drive you away from Christ. Paul says in Romans 8, 5, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit put their minds on the things of the Spirit. We are all fall from per far from perfect, are we not? I mean, if there's anybody in here that has got it all figured out, never sins, never has a moment of anger or unforgiveness or whatever it is, never falls prey to sin, please raise your hand. Okay, Max, we got you, bud. We are all very far from perfect, but our minds must be set on the things of God, not on the things of this world. The world tells us whatever feels good, do it. Whatever pleases us in that moment, do it. The world says when anger arises, spew it out. When gossip arises, spew it out. But the antithesis of that is the word of God that says no. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 18, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those are the things that defile a man. 
For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slander. And these are the things which defile a man. In other words, it is not the things that come in. Yes, temptation comes. Yes, thoughts come into our mind. Yes, we see things and things happen all around us. It is not until we begin to react and respond to them. It is what comes out that is the problem. I may be tempted, but that is not a sin. It is not until I allow my flesh to take over and I begin to act on it. There is where the problem comes in. It is what comes out of our mouth, our actions, our words, our emotions. That is the problem. Well, if God didn't want me to do it, he'd take the desires away. You are reading a Bible that I have never read. Please let me know what version that is. But if you don't think that is a predominant ideology in the modern Christian movement, you're crazy because it is. God wants me to be happy. God would never cause me to suffer, deny myself. Yes, he would. All throughout the Bible, Jesus over and over again says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. We have to understand that you and I have a part to play in all of this. When we give our lives to Christ, we surrender ourselves to him and his will. He, we make Jesus the Lord of our life. So I have a question for you. How is Jesus the Lord of our life if we continue to live in self-indulgence? If we were an objective person, we just began to step back and watch somebody's life and watch how they live, how they behaved, how they spoke, how they interacted with people. And we clearly saw that they indulged in sin and their flesh all the time. What would we say? Is that a person of the spirit or is that a person of the flesh? Well, don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm making an observation. How can we say that Jesus is Lord of our life if we are still indulging in sin con continually? If we continue to pursue the desires and lust of the flesh, how can we say Jesus is Lord when clearly he is not? If Jesus is Lord, we accept and obey his words over ours. We accept his will over ours. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The Bible says that he puts his flesh under subjection to his spirit. How many of you have ever fasted? That is the most miserable thing in the world. I'm telling you, I hate it. When we were in Las Vegas, Nevada, we used to fast for three days, twice a year. Whole church, well, most of the church. And it was, I mean, I'm telling you, nothing. Like some people fast, but they still, you know, do this or drink certain drinks or whatever. No, 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 nothing but water. And you know my coffee habit. A day and a half in, you're walking around with an ax right in the middle of your head for three days straight. The back of your throat hurts. Everything in your flesh says, I want food now. But the purpose there is that my flesh does not control me. My spirit does. And I can tell my flesh, no. I trust God for what I need. I want to close this morning. Temperance is a virtue. It is a godly trait that does not come natural to sinful humanity. It is about refusing to give a foothold to the enemy. It is about refusing to make provision for the flesh. When we 
objectively examine our lives, we have to ask ourselves, who is in control? Because I acknowledge that there are two spirits battling inside me. One that is the spirit of God and one that is the spirit of my flesh. And there is a constant battle all the time. And I have to step back and examine my life and say, who is in control of my life? Am I allowing God to lead me or am I allowing my flesh to lead me? Or better yet, how often do I allow the flesh to take over? See, a lot of times we can be going just smooth sailing and everything is wonderful until something happens. Somebody wrongs us or we've had a bad day or, or, or a temptation comes or whatever. See, a virtue that is not tested is not a virtue that we own. We can say that we are a, a forgiving person all day long, but until we've been put in a situation where we don't want to forgive someone, but we do, we truly cannot say that we are a forgiving person, right? So how often are we going along and all of a sudden we allow our flesh to take over and we react in anger or jealousy or bitterness how often do we fall prey to immorality and drunkenness and gossip or whatever it is? We're walking in the spirit until a problem comes in front of us. And that's where we truly decide, do we have self-control? Does the spirit of God control me or the spirit of my flesh? How many times do we find ourselves dealing with the same exact sin over and over and over and over? We're all going to sin from time to time and we're all going to fail. But you know, there becomes an issue when we find ourselves dealing with the exact same sin over and over and over and over and over again. Are we repenting of that sin? Are we telling our flesh, no? Are we trusting God? Freedom in Christ does not mean that we just get to cast off all moral restraint and live however we want. Paul says in Romans 6.1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? No. How can we who died to sin still continue to live in it? He says in Romans 13.14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. None. If you and I have been set free through Jesus Christ, then you and I are no longer slaves to sin. We must make every effort to live righteously before God and to bring our flesh under subjection, to deny our flesh and take up our cross and say, no, I'm going to do God's will. I'm going to obey God's spirit, even when I don't feel like it, even when everything in me says, no, I want to go down that road. I'm going to say no, and I'm going to obey Christ. We must bring our flesh under subjection, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I want to close with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Very quickly, we want to just transition our service very quickly and we want to ask you a very pointed and directed question. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life or is your flesh the Lord of your life? If you were to stand before God this morning, would he say to you to enter in or would he say depart from me? If Jesus Christ were to blow the trumpet and return tomorrow, would you be taken to him or would you be left? 
Is your heart right with God this morning? If it is not, I want to ask you, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. This is the most important part of the service. This is the most important part of our lives. Are we a Christian? Are we right with God? If you're not, simply lift up your hand and make that acknowledgement this morning that I want to get my heart right with God. I want to be a Christian. I want to make this God.